Hey everyone, welcome to another installment of Harry Potter Theory. Today we'll be discussing 10 more of the darkest moments of the Harry Potter series that were left out of the films. If you haven't watched part 1 of this series, go and check it out afterwards. Now onto today's picks for darkest moments that never made it from page to screen. Bill Weasley's Disfigurement In the aftermath of Dumbledore's death, Snape, the werewolf Fenrir Greyback, and a group of Voldemort's Death Eaters flee Hogwarts Castle. But as they attempt to get away, fighting ensues between those same wizards and a group of Order of the Phoenix members. Of course, one of those wizards involved is, you guessed it, Bill Weasley, who in the novel barely walks away from this fight, a rather stark contrast to the movie. After being viciously attacked by the werewolf Fenrir Greyback, Bill's face is absolutely destroyed to the point that his injuries are defined by Harry as being grotesque. As a relatively minor character in the movies, I guess it's no surprise that the film adaptation of the Half-Blood Prince didn't portray this much gorier detail, with Bill only sustaining a few rather insignificant scars on his face instead. In the movie, it's all rather glossed over, really. In the book, however, we're given all the gruesome details after Bill's encounter with Fenrir. Harry looked over Hermione's shoulder and saw an unrecognizable face lying on Bill's pillow, so badly slashed and ripped that he looked grotesque. In fact, this is the scene that prompts Bill's fiance, the enchantingly beautiful Fleur Delacour, to announce, I'm beautiful enough for the both of us, which makes a lot more sense due to how much more horrific Bill's disfigurement is in the novel. Barty Crouch Sr.'s Murder While it's true that we learn about Barty Crouch Sr.'s murder in the Goblet of Fire movie, the details surrounding his death are not all that clear. In fact, the audience only sees a glimpse of Barty Sr.'s lifeless body, without any further information other than the fact that the murderer is believed to be his son, Barty Crouch Jr. Compare this to the disturbing description we get of his murder, provided by Barty Crouch Jr. himself in the book. I killed my father. No, wailed Winky. Master Barty, Master Barty, what is you saying? You killed your father, Dumbledore said in the same soft voice. What did you do with the body? Carried it into the forest, covered it with the invisibility cloak. Dumbledore told me to go and look for my father. I went back to my father's body, watched the map. When everyone was gone, I transfigured my father's body. He became a bone, I buried it. While wearing the invisibility cloak in the freshly dug earth in front of Hagrid's cabin, the insane smile lit his features once more, and his head drooped onto his shoulder as Winky wailed and sobbed at his side. Yikes, what a psychopath. Hermione holding Rita Skeeter captive In the Goblet of Fire, Rita Skeeter is the nosy reporter who loves a good sensationalized story. Pursuing story after story that taints Harry's name and reputation, the movie version of this installment shows her to be a rather irritating character to say the least. However, we never really see anyone do much about this, which is distinctly different from the actions of Hermione in the book, in which the bright young witch, who fears expulsion worse than death, not only breaks the rules, she breaks the law, capturing Rita Skeeter in the form of a beetle and holding her hostage in a jar. You see, Rita Skeeter, it turns out, was actually an unregistered animagus and could transform undetected into an insect. Oh, Rita hasn't written anything at all since the third task, said Hermione in an oddly constrained voice. As a matter of fact, she added, her voice now trembling slightly, Rita Skeeter isn't going to be writing anything at all for a while, not unless she wants me to spill the beans on her. No, you see, Rita Skeeter, Hermione's voice trembled with quiet triumph, is an unregistered animagus. She can turn, Hermione pulled a small sealed glass jar out of her bag, into a beetle. You're kidding, said Ron, you haven't. She's not. No, I'm not, said Hermione, beaming. I caught her on the windowsill in the hospital wing. Look very closely, and you'll notice the markings around her antenna are exactly like those foul glasses she wears. Hermione took the glass jar back from Ron and smiled at the beetle, which buzzed angrily against the glass. I've told her I'll let her out when we get back to London, said Hermione. I've put an unbreakable charm on the jar, you see, so she can't transform. And I've told her she's to keep her quill to herself for a whole year. See if she can't break the habit of writing horrible lies about people. What's most disturbing about this turn of events in the novel is what it reveals about Hermione's darker instincts, and the pleasure she gets from keeping Rita Skeeter held captive in a jar and preventing her from returning to her human form. 
Of course, she means to eventually let her out, but realistically, Rita could have died in there, and it all just seems a little unsettling to me. Voldemort setting Neville's head aflame In the final movie of the series, we witness Neville become a hero several times over, with his ultimate act of bravery being when he stops Nagini, Voldemort's beloved pet snake and final horcrux, from killing Ron and Hermione by beheading her with the Sword of Gryffindor. Sadly, in the film, the context of what happens here is completely lost. Where did Neville come from, and how in Merlin's beard did he get the sword? Well, for those of you who've read the book, you know that he actually pays quite the price to retrieve the Sword of Gryffindor. After standing up to Voldemort and rejecting his invitation to become a high-ranking Death Eater, Neville is made a spectacle by the Dark Lord, who not only paralyzes him, he sets his entire head on fire. He pointed his wand at Neville, who grew rigid and still, then forced the hat onto Neville's head, so that it slipped down below his eyes. Neville here is now going to demonstrate what happens to anyone foolish enough to continue to oppose me, said Voldemort, and with a flick of his wand, he caused the sorting hat to burst into flames. Screams split the dawn, and Neville was aflame, rooted to the spot, unable to move, and Harry could not bear it. The Death of Bertha Jorkins in the Goblet of Fire film, the Dark Lord learns about the upcoming Triwizard Tournament through Peter Pettigrew and Barty Crouch Jr., and devises his plan to capture Harry Potter from the information these two wizards provide. In the book, however, it's the character of Bertha Jorkins, who's completely removed from the plotlines of the film, who spills the details of the tournament, and then pays the ultimate price for having that information, which tragically results in her utterly disturbing murder. After brutalizing her body and mind in order to break the memory charm that had been placed on her, Bertha was too damaged for the Dark Lord to possess, so instead, he did what he was known to do when people lost their value to him. He murdered her. Helena Ravenclaw's Full History In the second installment of The Deathly Hallows, we learn that Hogwarts Ravenclaw ghost, the Grey Lady, is none other than founding member Rowena Ravenclaw's daughter, Helena Ravenclaw. And while Harry's encounter with Rowena is certainly a little spooky in the movie, it's nowhere near as dark as her full history that she shares with Harry in the novel, for in the book we get a far more extensive and much darker account of what happened to Helena after she stole her mother's diadem and ran away. Then my mother fell ill, fatally ill. In spite of my perfidy, she was desperate to see me one more time. She sent a man who had long loved me, though I spurned his advances, to find me. She knew that he wouldn't rest until he had done so. Harry waited, she drew a deep breath and threw back her head. He tracked me to the forest where I was hiding. When I refused to return with him, he became violent. The Baron was always a hot-tempered man, furious at my refusal, jealous of my freedom. He stabbed me. The Baron? Do you mean? The Bloody Baron, yes, said the Grey Lady. And she lifted aside the cloak she wore to reveal a single dark wound in her white chest. When he saw what he had done, he was overcome with remorse. He took the weapon that had claimed my life and used it to kill himself. All these centuries later, he wears his chains as an act of penitence. As he should, she added bitterly. Peeves the Poltergeist and his darker instincts Peeves the Poltergeist was glaringly absent from the Harry Potter movies, and while much of his behavior would have added to the lighter side of the films, there are also many darker instincts within Peeves that were left out of the movies as a result. Throughout the books, Peeves typically played fairly harmless pranks on students and teachers alike, with Filch, the castle's caretaker, being a particularly favored target. However, some of his practical jokes were a little more on the alarming side. For example, in The Order of the Phoenix, he gleefully chases Professor Umbridge off school grounds, as he beats her with both a walking stick and a sock full of chalk. Considering Umbridge literally tortured students during her time as the professor against the dark arts, I suppose this send-off wasn't all that unsettling. But then again, he didn't just save this type of behavior for sadistic teachers. In fact, there were more than one occasion in which Peeves was violent towards students, jeopardizing both their safety and their lives. During Harry's time at Hogwarts, one of Peeves' main targets was Neville Longbottom, forcing the boy to set his own pants on fire and dropping objects on his head as he tried to walk to class. Although always portrayed lightly, these acts were clear representations of Peeves' inclinations towards violence. His behavior in 1876 is yet another example of his violent nature, when the caretaker that year, Rancorous Carp, attempted to capture Peeves. It did not go well at all, 
with Peeves escaping the trap and going on an epic rampage around the castle, firing off crossbows, guns, and a small cannon at students, which resulted in the school's three-day evacuation. Dumbledore's Dark Past In the films, we only briefly hear of Professor Dumbledore's dark past, with much of his relationship with Gellert Grindelwald and views as a young wizard left out. In the Deathly Hallows book, however, we hear firsthand from Dumbledore about his more disturbing behavior in his youth. In particular, he explains how he was incredibly arrogant, believing his talents to be wasted as his younger sister's guardian after the death of both his parents. While this is rather disappointing, it's not all that dark. His thoughts regarding muggles, however, are. In a rather disturbing admission, Dumbledore acknowledges to Harry that as a young man, he believed that humans should be subjugated and ruled by witches and wizards, believing magical beings to be a superior race. Grindelwald You cannot imagine how his ideas caught me, Harry, and flamed me. Muggles forced into subservience, we wizards triumphant, Grindelwald and I, the glorious young leaders of the revolution. Creature's Tale of Regulus Black's Death There's a much more in-depth description of the death of Sirius Black's younger brother, Regulus, in the Deathly Hallows novel when compared to the films, with the Black family's house elf creature explaining the dark details of exactly what happened to his former masters. In the book, the rather miserable house elf explains that, after pledging himself as a Death Eater at the age of just 16, Regulus inevitably had a change of heart and no longer wanted to serve the Dark Lord. Instead, after learning of Slytherin's locket, its role as a horcrux and Voldemort's hiding place for it, Regulus goes after it, intent on destroying it at any cost. Regulus ventures to the cave with Creature, drinks the potion, takes the locket, replacing it with a replica, and gives the real thing to Creature, ordering the house elf to return home without him. As you can imagine, Regulus does not survive this ordeal, and Creature last sees him being dragged underwater by the Inferi to his death, but not before he had left a note for Voldemort to find in the fake locket. To the Dark Lord, I know I will be dead long before you read this, but I want you to know that it was I who discovered your secret. I have stolen the real Horcrux and intend to destroy it as soon as I can. I face death in the hope that when you meet your match, you will be mortal once more. R.A.B. The Attack on Ariana Dumbledore The highly disturbing past of Albus Dumbledore's younger sister is not a subject that's really touched on in the films. While the movies do provide us with the context that Ariana was kept somewhat hidden from the public due to her ailing health, they never really get into the why of Ariana's rather odd situation. But in the books, much more detail is provided, and it's certainly on the darker side of things, for not only do we come to know that Ariana Dumbledore was killed around the age of 14 during a disagreement gone wrong between Albus, his brother Aberforth, and Gellert Grindelwald, we also learn how her condition came to be. In the Deathly Hallows novel, it's revealed that she was attacked as a small girl, no more than six years old, by a group of muggle boys. After witnessing her do magic, they tormented her to the point that she became traumatized beyond recovery. Many speculate that this attack may have even been quite physical in nature, which would explain why their father, Percival Dumbledore, went after the boys, an act which resulted in Percival being sent to Azkaban. And with that, we've come to the end of another video. What did you think? Do you agree with my picks? Did I miss any dark moments from the books that are left out of the films? Please share your thoughts in the comments below, and as always, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and subscribe to the channel. Also, be sure to check out the content on Spotify, as well as extra content on my second channel, Harry Potter Theory Extra. Until next time, remember, it does not do to dwell on dreams, and forget to live. <laughs>